In a frankly predictable twist of fate, rather than play one of the numerous games from my backlog as material for this video, I ended up watching the first episode of Dungeon Meshi and then promptly devoured the entire manga in two sittings and got brain worms preventing me from focusing on anything else before I make a video somehow related to that series. Now, this isn't going to be a review, nor are there going to be any spoilers on that manga. It's amazing, go read it, the animated adaptation by Studio Trigger is good so far as well. But going through it planted an idea in my head that I wanted to explore. See, I had this series recommended to me time and time again by cool people, people whose opinions on media I tended to agree on more often than not. And yet, every time I thought about it, there was some internal barrier that prevented me from starting it. The idea of combining a D&D-esque fantasy with a cooking show seemed like... Well, like a one-note joke that will grow stale on me really fast. Which is weird in retrospect, given how I have cooked at least once every single week of my life since I turned 18 and enjoyed it every single time. And that I have been a fantasy mark for much, much longer than that. So you'd think this would be a match made in heaven. And yet, that thought didn't occur to me. And being the clueless buffoon that I am, I had to actually read it for the beauty of this concept to click. Food is a varied and wonderful thing, both when it comes to making it and eating, but it's one of these things that gets omitted in stories unless it's dramatically appropriate. Just like the thing that happens a few hours after you eat, you don't show it unless it's going to relate to the plot and themes in some way. And that's understandable, because I don't think anyone really buys a comic book to see Batman eat a hamburger. But at the same time, food can say so much, both about the characters and, in case of fictional settings, about the world. And this seemingly simple thing is something that Dungeon Meshi understood and presented perfectly. Eating is one of the most universal experiences there is, so what better way to make a fantastical world seem real than to put it on a dinner table? To make something into food, be it a fantastical beast, magical herbs or the seeds of a certain tall species of grass, is to understand it. So I thought it would be an interesting avenue to explore in a video, how an author can make the audience learn about their world through food. You would think this idea would show up in my head earlier, considering the ungodly amount of hours I spent watching channels like Townsend's and Tasting History, but I guess I needed to see a dwarf use a dungeon slime as gelatin for it to really click. Full disclaimer, this is going to be about games, because the element of interactivity is what makes this really interesting for me, especially when an idea of a fictional world is being sold to you. With other popular media, be it in literature, films, TV series and such, this really boils down to what the authors decide to show or not. But with the element of the audience participating in the story and world, this gains a new dimension worth talking about. Now, the cultured among you may have noticed that this video's title is cribbing from a video by Mr. Bitang, hallowed be his name, in which this was a comparison point between Fallout 3 and New Vegas. To summarize quickly, in New Vegas you can clearly see the infrastructure and farming going on in several places, effectively selling you the picture of a functioning society, even if the scale is not all there if you really squint because it's still a game in Gamebryo made 14 years ago. In Fallout 3, there's nothing but ruins, dust and boxes of food that should have expired a century ago. What the hell do they eat? Because once you notice the fact that the characters seem to exist independent of the world surrounding them, the illusion breaks hard. Now, food is just one way this can break, but I think it's the easiest one to notice, because we all eat and the question of procuring food after the apocalypse is an interesting one. Things we take for granted becoming hard to come by are pretty much the foundation of the genre. If you don't have a side tale about a family protecting their irradiated patch of land they rely on for survival, why are we even here? New Vegas is not off the hook either though, because while it delivers when it comes to foodstuffs on a macro level, I think it leaves something to be desired when it comes to the player interaction with it. Because while the devs went out of their way to include an interesting variety of things considered food as items, a whole damn cooking system to turn raw ingredients into dishes more beneficial to you, and a whole optional hunger system if you turn on the hardcore mode, and it's just utterly forgettable. For one, the UI makes your entire inventory a list with a monochrome picture of the thing with dry stats of how much it will heal you and lower your hunger by. It feels less like playing the role of someone feeling hunger and more like rolling to a gas station because the fuel gauge is low. 
This is a problem inherited from working with the Fallout 3 UI, and in general, I just don't understand why Bethesda games are allergic to having any kind of flavor text for the items in the game. Sure, I'm gonna read it once and that's it, but that one time is going to inform how I will view the world of the game for the rest of the playthrough. Does the bloat fly meat stink? Is this gun awkward to hold? Are the color of the mac and cheese boxes still aggressively yellow despite the years since they were manufactured? There's so much feeling that can be conveyed in a small blurb, especially with words as big as theirs. But honestly, the UI issue relates to a lot of games, where the inventory is so cramped that you get nothing but a list of things in your backpack, maybe with a small icon at best. These small things don't feel real and in turn it kinda stains your perception of the game world as a whole. When it comes to the cooking system in New Vegas, the issue is the weird specificity of it. You need to find a fireplace instead of just being able to make one yourself, and each recipe has a very specific list of ingredients. You would think that if you want to convey the idea of surviving in a desert, you would integrate being able to set up camp and make do with what you've got. Sure, you may not make a Brahmin burger, but you got some raw gecko meat on hand as a substitute. Sorry, there is no recipe for that, raw meat down the gut for dinner it is. Surprisingly, a city builder I played recently, Against the Storm, did very well with that idea. It also takes place in an apocalyptic setting, albeit much wetter, and the variety of how you can approach these problems is where the game shines. Sure, the kiln is primarily for turning wood into charcoal, but we can fry some meat in there if we have no better options. No meat? That's fine, we can make shish kebabs with insects as well. It won't be as efficient as the perfect solution of having a dedicated cookhouse, but you do what you gotta do to make living in a forest that is trying to kill you bearable. A+. On the topic of city builders, a lot of them also suffer from this weird specificity sometimes. In Anno 1800, for example, you can have fields of potatoes the size of Ireland, but not even the most desperate farmer will eat them. They only serve as raw materials for alcohol. And farmers apparently eat nothing but fish. It's not a deal breaker, and I get the idea of the social strata being portrayed by a more and more complex diet, but it does feel artificial, especially when your entire economy collapses because you weren't looking and forgot to hire more fishermen as your city expanded or something. Alright, enough complaining. You know what game did a spectacular job? More wind. Because in one of the early quests for a fighter's guild, you get to visit an egg mine. The local population has whole cavernous setups where these huge bugs known as Kwama make their colonies and they harvest a part of the egg yield from the queen. So, of course, thieves disrupting such an ecosystem are a huge problem and you gotta deal with them. And in pretty much every pantry you come across a staple crop of salt rice, not to mention you can stumble across fields of them being worked by slaves because the dark elves who rule this place are colossal dicks. Again, I wish there was flavor text to describe the well, flavor, but I think it's remarkable that I may not remember who the hell ruled House Hlalu, but I will remember that if I were to be a simple man living in Vardenfell, my lunch would probably be Kwama eggs over salt rice. On the topic of good examples, I would be remiss to not include vanillaware games like Odin Sphere or Dragon's Crown. Watching a Baromet's plant get infused with magic and pop out a whole ass ship was a magical experience to me as a child, and I just adore the sprite work of the growth of each individual plant. And the cooking minigame in Dragon's Crown is just pornographic, there is no other way to describe it. You may not be able to taste the ingredients you fight over with your party members at the campfire, but your eyes are feasting nonetheless just wonderful. And yeah, if we slew a dragon, I want to try frying its tail. You got the crack and stew last time, Jacob! Stop hugging all the good stuff! This same sense of pleasure through aesthetics can be seen in games like Monster Hunter, and it's always a nice little break from gun lancing dinosaurs. Though, on the note of eating your enemies, I do find it kind of funny how quickly games with multi-layered simulation make their players delve into cannibalism. These bandits may have been people, but meat is meat, and it's at least some profit that comes out of prevailing in a situation that could have potentially ruined your entire run. Absolute freedom in gameplay also means freedom from the constraints of morality, and I think it's interesting how this level of granularity lets you just find ways to be absolutely awful in a safe environment. Fertilize the earth with the blood of your enemies. Hunt the innocent for sustenance. Your little hamlet hungers after the crop failure. Eat or be eaten.
Speaking of horrible things, in fantasy settings there is sometimes this notion of a horror hunger. You are a vampire and need to drink blood, or you must devour souls to survive. This is also the most common way to integrate the notion of hunger into other media as well. A universal craving, twisted and distorted into something hurtful and making you into a monster. In Vampire the Masquerade, the tabletop game, it is even advised to let an early feeding scene be detailed, personal. A whole few minutes of stalking, hunting, manipulating, feeding. And once there are bigger concerns, make it mundane, talked over, insignificant. By the end of the campaign, the question of how many lives you've ruined is as pointless as asking someone how many loaves of bread they ate in their lives. Honestly, even outside of that concept, the mundanity of eating can be used for horror surprisingly well. Some people may get angry at me for including a visual novel when talking about games, but in the final route of Fate Stay Night, called Heaven's Feel, there is a particular prolonged sequence that comes to mind. Without getting into spoilers, everyone in the story knows things are going to get bad, but not when, and we are treated to just day after day of mundane life, with descriptions of our protagonist Boishiro cooking, as we are waiting for shit to hit the fan at any moment, as there is really nothing else he can do. And it just goes on and on, and the descriptions just start slipping your mind as you await for the other thing to happen. It's tense and worrying. Granted, I also think it could be like half of its length and still convey the message, but still, I like it in concept. But I also need to mention, please no groans from the returning audience, you knew this was coming, pathologic. In both instances of that story, the flavor text on all the foodstuffs is just great, but in particular in the first game you get these short descriptions of just how nasty everything is. The milk is curdled, potentially spoiled, with clumps in it. On a first playthrough, you may hover over that icon for a moment and wonder if this is a good idea at all. A few hours into the play, you just click it without thought. You've got places to fucking be. You can't fret if this food will kill you tomorrow considering the hunger is killing you right now. And in that moment, you and the unfortunate healer you play as are one. God, Pathologic is such a good game, it's insane that we are still having the R video games art conversation in the mainstream. Of course, we need to mention the broad genre of survival as well, as procuring food and keeping the dreadful hunger meter at bay is a core mechanic in this. It doesn't really do much if you just find things and shove them into your digital gallet. I wish I could strangle every person who thought that realism means adding that as a mechanic with no further depth, but I think there is a lot of space to make discovery a part of the fun. What is poisonous? What is worth going out of your way to get? Can you combine ingredients in a way that is even more beneficial? Granted, there is always the risk of optimizing fun out of the game over time, but I think that by the point you have every aspect of the system at the back of your head, you've had plenty of fun on the way there. Unless you are a smelly wiki diver, that is. This was used masterfully in Metal Gear Solid 3, where in order to live up to the name of Snake Eater, you… well, eat snakes and frogs, and every other living thing in your immediate area as you sneak through the dense tropical jungles of Siberia. And with each fruit, mushroom and animal you put in your pockets, you can call your team paramedic to get a conversation that goes like this. Snake, this is a poison dart frog. It's so toxic that if you lick it, you'll die in agony as you shit your own ass for hours and invert all of your organs as they jettison out of your butthole. Hmm, <laughs> noted. But what would it taste like before I died? Eh, probably better than the Soviet Russians. Like, this mechanic can be safely ignored for most of the game, you can blitz through it and not worry about the stamina meter that much, but the level of care put into it is so lovely and it turned my wee self into a digital sashimi enjoyer as I became an anthropomorphic plague of locusts devouring everything in its path. And in some areas that are army bases, you can find the pantry used by the enemy soldiers, blow it up, leave and then come back to have an easier time as starvation dulled everyone's senses. You can also atone by leaving them some snacks. Here you go, Mr. Conscript, one poison dart frog, still fresh. Man, what a game. People keep joking about Kojima making his employees work on movies disguised as games, but there's honestly not many titles that can match the frankly insane amount of details, workarounds and easter eggs in MGS. You just don't do that if you hate your job and wish you were doing something else. And growing up playing them sets your expectations so unreasonably high that you are destined to become a YouTuber complaining about everything. Including fucking food in video games. Is any of this important? 
No, not really. Nobody turns on a game after making dinner to have their digital avatar demand they get dinner in the virtual world as well. There are a million priorities that come in game dev before adding bits of flavor in the form of optional food items. I don't think Monster Hunter would be less popular as a series if they never added food to it at all. But at the same time, if you do include it, if a 5 polygon model of cheese made it into your game, consider why you put it in there. Everyone can relate to hunger, and while we don't expect the proverbial camera to show us every meal, people do pay attention when it shows one. Dante eats pizza once in Devil May Cry 3, and everyone associates that wacky woohoo demon hunter with everyone's favorite cheesy flatbread. So, if for whatever reason you decide that you should include a character in your game getting hungry, what do they eat? And why? Because if they just eat whatever they have at hand, they are either desperate beyond hope, or they are not human at all. I guess what I'm trying to say is, please include your favorite recipe in the comments. I've been fixated on making burritos whenever I don't have an idea of what to cook for half a year now. I've eaten more beans in this time than in 30 years of my life prior to that. I'm too young to optimize fun out of my life, help! Oh yeah, I should do an outro. Huge thanks to everyone supporting me on Patreon, who make it possible to turn my whims and little fixations into a source of income. I would like to welcome new patrons of the arts, Galactic Beyond and Noirscape. Thank you for putting your trust in me. Moreover, huge thanks to people who held the disco video in such high regard that they threw more money at me. DLXR, Anonymous Donor, Tana Windin, Flo and Da Helmet. The next video will continue the theme of food as we will burn our bread. I just need to beat the game first. See ya!